As you can see, my name is Ivan. <laughs> I'm not even going to pronounce my surname. <laughs> so, uh, some time ago, I started working in KDE, and that's mostly my background as far as Qt is concerned. I love giving talks, I love teaching, and obviously, I'm a functional programming guy. If you ever saw any of the presentations I had at Qt Dev Days or Meeting C++ or some, somewhere else. So, first, a couple of disclaimers. I usually start my presentations with, what the hell? <laughs> okay. So, at least you can, you can read what, uh, what, what's written. So, the first dis disclaimer is that you should make your code readable, because somebody who can read your code afterwards might be a psychopath and he knows where, you, where you're located at. That doesn't mean that you should actually write the code like you're writing for a high schooler. You should write advanced code and proper code, just don't use some evil stuff that nobody will understand ever. Uh, the second part is that these are slides, these are, this is not production code, and blah, blah, blah. So, uh, why I decided to talk about the Q future? Uh, quite a long time ago, the first time when I was at Q to Dev Days, I was talking about something related to futures, and I mentioned Q future, and everybody started laughing because we all, all know that Q future is a really crappy class. And because of that, uh, from that point on, I always put some code snippet of QFuture so that the audience can laugh. And always I say, okay, we are not going to go into a rant about the QFuture. And this time I decided to actually do rant about QFuture. And you will see why. So first, let's talk about the future concept itself. In essence, the normal way to call a function is you call a function. When the function completes whatever it is intended to do, it will return a value, and then you can use that value. But what if that function takes a lot of time to complete? What if the function is, for example, I.O.? You're asking the user to type you something, you're reading something from the drive, which can be slow, you, you do network communication, which again, you cannot guarantee that it will happen quickly. Instead of having a function re which returns an actual value, what is a, Q uh, what is a future? Okay, we usually deal with this with callbacks, signal slots, and creating a new thread and do the actual work on the thread. And our code is, starts looking really crappy. Instead of having a normal flow of logic like the diagram on the left, you have actually to split every single thing that you do into a call and callback, call and callback, and then you end up with something that looks like one of my fa favorite uh, <laughs> things. This is a spaghetti code by George Hutt, and this is actually how a lot of cute projects really look like. And Although this is a really nice as art, it's not, it wouldn't be really nice as uh, project design. So instead of having calls, callbacks, and directly calling functions that return values, we want to have some, an advanced, simple but advanced concept called a future. What is a future? It's a handle that will eventually get a value. So you're getting a handle like a small box in which somebody will, at some point in the future, put the actual value. And that's a really, really simple concept. Now, how do you get the value from the future? The most obvious way when you see the API is to call that get. Who can see the problem in this pattern? Get is going to block. Essentially, somebody gave you a future for a reason. It's uh, an expensive operation which will uh, yield its result much later. And then you call a .get and you're making a synchronous call. Like a normal function, you're blocking your main code. So this is something that you absolutely should never do. There are use cases for .get, but we are not going to, to go into those. 
some of the libraries that you will be able to use with futures don't actually allow you to call .get on a future that is not completed. You will get a segmentation fault or an exception or something. Unfortunately, both Qt and std standard library block when the .get is being called. So what you should do instead, instead of calling .get, you should, when you get to the handle, you don't care about the result. You just want to tell, okay, this is my box, which will eventually get a value. And you, that box, you, you should explain to that box what it should do with the value when it gets it. So you don't anymore, you don't care about the, the, the value that you will get, you're just explaining the future, what it should do with the value once the value is available. So in this case, some sell the code, we have a handler, and we want to, when the future arrives, we want to call a lambda on that value. Uh, what will, it will look like this in C++17, the, the middle line, handler.den. You can pass, similar to this, not exactly, you can pass a lambda that will be able to use the value once it's completed. And fortunately, in C++ 20 something, we will, hate, uh, we will have uh, a wait, which will be a magical thing, and it will be inspired by monads and stuff like that. So we, will, we are going to skip that unless somebody is interested. If somebody is interested, you can ask at the end of the talk uh, what the await will be like. OK, one quote about, from John Carmack, we don't care. So. <laughs> okay, so uh, in his uh, blog post about functional programming in C++, he said that usually most of our bugs are because we don't understand the state of our program and in which different states our program can be in. And when you actually add threading and asynchronous computations like futures and everything else, you just create much worse uh, problems for yourself. So in C++, we have a couple of libraries that provides us, provide us with futures. One is the std future, which is not so great at, at this point. In C++ 17, it will be nice. Uh, boost future, which is what std future will be. So it has dot then, it has everything that you wanted to, to do, to have. And we have poly future, which is a Facebook library. Uh, Folly Future is designed after the, the same class in the Scala programming language. And this is the one that will throw an exception if you call a dot .get on an unfinished future. Which is a beautiful design because it will force you not to use dot .get. And obviously we have the queue future and here begins the rant. So, queue future started its life as a part of the Qt concurrent. And the idea was, if you need to process a large collection of data, for example, sum a huge list of numbers, uh, Qt is helpful enough to spin a few threads, give a part of that collection to each of the threads, each of the threads calculates its part, and then it returns the final value, for example, if you want to get a sum of uh, a collection of numbers. So you had operations like filtering, mapping, so map reduce and everything else. And the main use case, especially with the dot get method, was the fork join pattern. So you fork your process into a, multi, uh, a few threads. When all the threads finish, you join them and you get back the result. And that works really well for the use cases that Qt Concurrent does. Unfortunately, in Qt 5, the idea was to make the queue future much more useful. So uh, Mark from KDAB argued that queue future should not be in Qt concurrent, that it should be moved to Qt core because it's a really useful concept. And it can be used outside of the Qt concurrent. So on the road to Qt 5, this is one of the mails Mark wrote. And Finally, we have the queue future as a part of Qt core and all is well. At least that was the idea. The problem is that queue future is still meant to handle only thread-based asynchronous operations. So 
For example, you need to have a thread pool in order for it to work correctly and everything else. And still, Qt has a lot of classes inside or a lot of methods that could have used QFuture, but they are not because QFuture is actually not meant to be used as a proper future. We have a QMeta object invoke method, which is something that can invoke Qt's uh, meta methods. And from the documentation, you can see if the invocation is asynchronous, so you pass the Qt invocation argument. The return value cannot be evaluated. Why? Why doesn't evoke method return a Q future? The second thing, we have at least one class that is similar to QDBus pending reply, which is, uh, who knows DBus? Okay, so DBus is IPC protocol on Linux. You call something, then you get the result. And because it can be an expensive operation, it can take some time, the pending reply is something that will allow you to register and know when the reply actually arrived. What is the difference between QDBus pending reply and the concept of futures? Absolutely nothing. It's, again, it's something, it's a handler to a value that will appear sometime in the future. Then we have QNetwork reply, again, you're asking for something, you're getting a value at some point in the future back. And that thing also is not a queue future. So we have at least, I've listed at least the three items from Qt, one item from KDE Frameworks, and all of those essentially are futures. But we cannot use them as futures because queue future was not meant to be used like that. So, why it would be a re really a nice thing to have a normal future that can model everything that we already have seen. Sometimes you want just to implement your own stuff and you don't care whether your process result function will be called on a network reply, on a DBus reply, on a user input or anything else. You just need to pass it and tell it this value will appear sometime in the future. You can't do it, you have to write process result for each and every of the Qt classes that can return you a value sometime in the future because QFuture is not a super class of all of those. And QFuture cannot be legally used to, to model all of those. So it, will, it would be really, really beneficial if we could use QFutures in a normal way. So the next thing, if we kind of see for what we can use Qt futures, and we told that it's now Qt core and not Qt concurrent. How can we create a future, an instance of it? First thing, you open the, the API, you see there, is, there are two constructors. One constructor is the default one, and one is the copy constructor. The default one creates an invalid future, and the copy constructor obviously copies the future. So from the normal part of the API, at least as far as the Qt core is concerned, the only future that you're ever, ever going to be able to create is an invalid future and copy, copy it around, which is again completely useless, right? Then you open the API documentation, and what, what do you get from the docs? To start a computation, use one of the APIs in the concurrent fra uh, framework. So in a class that is in a Qt core, the only way to construct it is by going through Qt concurrent. So it's not really separate, right? And that's one of my favorite pet peeves with, with a Qt future. How do you get the value? You can call .get, which we already said it's a bad thing to do. Alternatively, if you want to to chain a continu continuation to a future. Instead of calling dot .den, which we don't have in Qt, we need to get this snippet of code. Because QFuture is not meant to be used like this. It's meant for the fork join pattern. So, let's continue. Uh, there, is, there are quite, quite a few peculiarities uh, regarding QFuture. Usually when you say this is a future of integer, you mean 
after a while, uh, an integer will pop up, right? With QFutra, it's not really a single integer. You can get a list of integers. A single future of int is not a single future value of int, but a series of values of integer. Again, why? Because Qt, it was useful for Qt concurrent. So whenever you see Q future of t, you, you should just think of your, for yourself in your head, it's a Q future of a list of t's. Okay? The second thing is that it can store an exception. So, for example, you called the Qt concurrent run, and the function that was run asynchronously throws an exception. It will be stored in the future so that you can access it somehow. The problem is that you don't have the API to access it. The only way to access the, the stored error inside the Qt future is to actually call .get to force the C++ runtime to actually throw the, the exception again and then to catch it with a try-catch block, which is everything but efficient. And that's something that I actually tried to, to push a patch to Qt and got rejected because who, who would ever need to actually check for an error inside the Qt future? But who cares? The sec and the last strange thing is that when I tell you, I'll, you ask me for the time, and I, okay, I'll tell you later, I'm just doing something else. Is it normal for you to, in the middle of my work, to tell me, okay, pause that? No, when you say, I want a cure future, it's not something that you should be able to pause. It's not a job, it's not a task, it's not called queue job, it's called queue future. But queue future has set pause, it has cancel, it has a lot of methods that are just not meant for futures. And I think this is the end of the rant. So since the queue future is a really nice concept and it's ABI stable so you can use it in your APIs and everything else, it's really a shame that you can't really use it. So I decided to take a, take a dive into the code and see how the queue future is actually implemented and whether I can count on the internal uh, implementation to be API and ABI compatible. So every queue future that you have is instantiated by a class called queue future interface, which you can implement for yourself. So we are going, now going to see a couple of examples. Obviously, uh, if you read the first paragraph, we are going to pretend that we are legal programmers. We are not going to subvert C++ to actually access private parts of your future. We are going to do just the things that C++ allows us to do legally. And legally, I say, uh, I Okay, so what is the simplest way to create a future with a predefined value? You create a new QFuture interface create a future from it, then say, okay, this future, the, the thing that calculates it has started, it reported the result, uh, which is uh, specified by the value variable, and you report that you have finished. Now you have created a future which already has a value. Unlike the default API, which only allows you to create a canceled future, now you can even create a future that already has a value. Not much use of, for that, but it's a start. If you want to create a future that has an error, it's almost the same, just instead of reporting a value, report an exception. Okay? What if you want to create actually something a little bit more advanced? For example, you want to create a delayed future, which will be able to return you a specified value after some amount of time. For example, you want to get the, you're contacting a server and you want to get a default value after a minute if the, the connection broke or something like that. You want to have a delayed future with a default value. You would inherit from, from QObject in order to be able to use QTimers properly uh, and then you inherit the QFuture interface of T. 
how do you implement the method that actually returns a new future called start? Simply, the same code that we already had, you say report started, and when the timer hits off, you report the result, you report it is finished, and you delete later the, you, this, the delayed future interface. So now we have a little bit more advanced block. Instead of just having the, the rudimentary, we already have a value. We are now able to create a future that will actually return us a value after a specific, specified amount of time. And uh, because I was bored at, at some point in my life, I decided to start writing a better library just as a playground thingy uh, that, that kind of digs through all of the QFuture back stuff in order to provide an API that could actually be used. So how do I create a QFuture when you have wrappers for a lot of stuff? If you want to create a future that is already here, you just write make ready future. This is a pendant for the make ready future that will be in STD, uh, the standard template library, for the STD future. If you want to create a cancelled future, you can create the void one or the integer one or whatever you want. You can create, uh, instantiate the thing that we saw earlier, make delayed future, it will return the value 42 after an hour and 30 minutes has, has passed. And by the way, this, this works obviously only in C++14. Now, these futures might have not been that, much, that, that useful. You can create wrappers for a lot of different, different things. For example, dbus async call. Instead of returning a dbus pending reply, it will return a proper future which you can pass on to an API that requires futures. Then you have process get output. It will wait for all the, the whole process to finish and it will return your result. Again, exec and similar stuff. For everything that you actually need, you will be able to create a wrapper that in a, as efficient as possible way uh, creates a new queue future. How do you get a value from a queue future? You don't. One of the benefits of the strange implementation of the queue future proper is that if you don't base it uh, on threads and thread pools, when somebody calls dot get on your custom made future, he will get a sec fault. And that's one of the things that I actually like, and because that way, anybody who actually uses my library that returns him a future will have to avoid calling .get, which is so freaking cool. And uh, some people actually thought it was a bug, but I had, uh, I took an hour to explain that it's a feature. So you never should call .get on a future. What you should do is pass it on to something else. So what have I started implementing. Uh, most of these things uh, are functioning properly. Some of the things need to, uh, to, to be continued. So one of the things that you can do on a future is pipe it through a transformation. So for example, you want to get a user input, some block of text, and you want to have length of that text when the text appears. You just need to, to do input pipe transform, transform with what function with qString column column length. Uh, who has seen the boost range or the range proposal for C++ now 20 something? Okay, so the, the approach is the same. You have a collection and you pass it through a series of transformations. Something like SQL, something like shell programming and stuff like that. And a future is, again, it's a kind of a collection. It's not a collection that immediately, immediately has all the data, but it's a collection that will sometime, at some point in the future have data. So it's kind of obvious that we should be able to use it as if it were a collection. Alternatively, you can pass the input through a filter. You got a 
an array of lines from the user, you want to validate and remove all the invalid ones. You just type through a filter function, okay? And just remember, QFuture of string is essentially QFuture of list of strings. So the filter here will get a list of strings and just remove all those that are not valid. Now the next thing, both QString length and input validation functions are fast functions. They are not functions that will block your, your main thread or anything else. But what should you do if you actually have a couple of functions that you want to chain? And all of those functions should be asynchronous. So all of those functions should return a queue future. For example, I want to send a request to a web page. That web page will return HTML code to me, to me. I will parse the HTML code and then send a synchronous request for all the images that are inside that web page. So all of those are kind of asynchronous functions. You can't do anything apart maybe from parsing and extracting images. Everything else needs to be done asynchronously in order not to block the main thread. So what can you do? You can just pipe it directly to something else. And this is something that in functional programming is called the monadic bind. So you have two functions that return a queue future. They ask for a value and return a queue future. And you want to compose them so that when the result of the first one, the future, arrives, it automatically passes to the second one. If we use the transform like in the previous slide, uh, no. what would happen? Input transform some function that returns a queue future. The whole type will be queue future of a queue future of a value. OK? Let me repeat. So uh, is, is it obvious what transform does? OK, so you have a Q future of some type, some type T, T1. And you have a function that takes a T1 and returns T2. OK, when you call transform on a Q future of T1, it will return a Q future of T2. OK, but if that function actually doesn't take a T1 and returns a T2, but takes a T1 and returns a Q future of T2, Transform would transform from the queue future T1 to a queue future Q future T2. Okay? It's a little bit sick, but <laughs> bear with me. And queue futures of futures are really useless. So there is a method called flatten, which would get an uh, array of nested futures and just give you a proper future of T. Instead of always chaining transform and flatten, the API just provides you the ability, okay, this is the wrong slide, sorry. Uh, the ability to directly pipe through some Q future returning function, and it, it will automatically do the transform and the flattening. Okay? No? Questions? Yeah, that's why I said monadic bind. And usually I do talk about monads. <laughs> okay, apparently I should have said that in a microphone. I'm recognizing monads all over the place. Aren't okay, I? so a member of the audience uh, said that he was recognizing monads, and I said that, yeah, uh, this is all monadic, mon monad based. Essentially, Q future is general concept of futures is one of aspect, one of the different types of monads. But um, I didn't want to actually talk about monads this time as well. Okay, so the idea here is that you should be able to use a queue future and compose as many functions as you want to it until you get the result that you actually want to have. And when that result arrives, you just process it and pass it to, to the handler. Unlike the normal Qt signal slot stuff, 
in signals and slots you have a signal and you connect it directly to a function that will process the result. Here you can chain as many things as you want before actually connecting it to, to the handler. Okay? And the usual things that you should always have in all libraries like this, if you have a collection of multiple futures, it would be nice that you have the API that will return you a future of the collection and others. I think this few should be quite, uh, quite obvious what they're doing. Okay, so this was really fast. I thought that I, I'll have half an hour for my talk. Now, what are the limitations even with this idea that you can compose futures as much as you want? The limitations are that Although the, the, the future of T is a future of list of T, you can't really use it in a normal reactive stream kind of stuff. For example, one of the useful things to have when is to map all the user input as a stream of events, right? So you have every time that the user moves a mouse, you want to have a stream that returns you coordinate, 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 coordinate. Okay? And for the first coordinate, you can use the Q future. Because the first time the user moves the mouse, you'll get the value for the future that you created. The problem is that you cannot model the whole stream with Q futures. Why is that? Because Q future keeps everything in memory. Every single value that you have in the list will always be in that future. So it's uh, completely unlike, for example, standard input streams. Just imagine if the standard input stream remembered all the lines that you read before the line that you currently are reading, which would be completely useless, right? The Q future, unfortunately, doesn't have the ability to forget some of the previous values. So you can't model a lot of advanced stuff uh, with Q, Q, Q futures, you can essentially model just the simplest ones, like I have a single value or a couple of them. Okay, and this, I, I don't think that anything else is worth mentioning. So, now questions. Okay, before the questions. Uh, one thing that I didn't uh, talk about is how would you design your software so that you do these transformations, filtering and everything else, and to design huge programs with it. Uh, I didn't talk about it mainly because I talked about it the in the previous year, and because you can't use Q futures for that. One of the great ideas of functional programming is that you have some input, you transform it, transform it, do whatever you want with it, and then you have the values that you want to use. And that's something that I, I was hoping I'll be able to do with QFutures. Unfortunately, because of the simple limitation that, for example, this thing with the memory, you can do a little, uh, really, really rudimentary stuff with a QFuture. But the idea of having something uh, like a queue future, that you can pipe through transformations, that you can chain, that you can do whatever you want, that is a really, really powerful and useful thing. Unfortunately, queue future will not help you with that. And now questions. Any questions? Raise your hand. Actually, why you based it on Q future, not uh, on the next standard future, as in C17? Uh, the reason why is that I had, I, I maintain one of the frameworks in KDE, and it is really debug heavy. And the first version was synchronous, and it blocked everywhere because debug is freaking slow. And I decided, okay, I need something like a Q future. Should I create my own, which will be ABI stable? 
Probably not because that framework is not for creating a futures. Then I considered STD future. Unfortunately, it's not ready. And unfortunately, KD frameworks are still pre-C++11. We need to, to remain compatible and everything else. And STD future doesn't really guarantee ABI. At least the GCC's implementations sometimes break ABI from major versions and stuff like that. And the reason is that I used Q Future because it was in Qt. I was able to hack through it to, to actually achieve what I wanted to without much overhead, like spinning off threads unnecessary and keeping the ABI. But yes, I, I would have probably gone for the Facebooks one. First, then boost, and then in the future, I would choose the STD future. Mm. Are Sarit Futures supported? Uh, sorry? Are Sarit Futures supported? Sarit. Share. Uh, honestly, I hate uh, anything that, that has the shared name inside. Essentially, uh, okay, uh, not in the real world. I'm, I'm, after all, a free software guy, right? But uh, any time that you have uh, concurrent stuff, anything that is shared is bad. So you should either not share and keep things to yourself, or you should not have concurrency. Anytime you try to mix those, you need to lock. You need mutexes, you need all of the things that will just slow your, uh, your software down. And you should all, if possible, you should always avoid it in your design, software design. Next. Just a quick one. Could you do me a little favor and just share the presentation, please, if possible? The slides. Uh, 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 which part? What I want to say is share the presentation, the file. Uh, sorry? I, I think... <laughs> okay, so, sorry, I, I heard you. <laughs> Could you show? Okay, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> okay, okay. There was a question in the back. Yeah. Although I would recommend not li uh, <laughs> looking at this one. Uh, in the past year, I was talking about reactive Qt. And uh, this year at Meeting C++, I will be talking a, a little bit continuing on the reactive stuff. And usually I talk about these things, but in a more useful way than just talking how bad Q future is. But I will post it. Uh, I have a question regarding this get and uh, how you hate it so much um, because I think get gives you synchronization and that's a sometimes good thing I, uh, I guess. Uh, synchronization is sometimes necessary. I wouldn't say it is, uh, it is good at any point. Uh, there is one of one really nice comment about, about mutexes in general by David Butenhoff. He said that in one of the mailing lists, he said that we shouldn't have called the mutex mutex because it's a cute name and everybody likes it. We should have called it bottleneck. So bottlenecks are sometimes necessary. They're useful, but you should never put them in your code if you don't actually need to. If you design your software in a proper way, you should never be. Uh, you should never need to do explicit synchronization on a top level. In the libraries, okay, that build to something. But I would say that most of the time, unless you're doing parallel processing, graphics, and stuff like that, which is the fork join pattern, uh, what is made for, uh, I would say dot get should be destroyed. Essentially, if you want to have your uh, system asynchronous, and as soon as you call that get, it's not. 
and that destroys the idea of having the asynchronous system in the first place. So, useful, yes, sometimes. Good, never. <laughs> it should work in a, reason, in a reasonable, predictable way. For me, the reasonable way for a .get is to crash. For example, you have a pointer that is invalid. When you try to dereference de it, what does it do? It's a sec fault. When you try to dereference de a future, it's not yet here. It should be a sec fault. I'm not saying that this is the only that this is the only way to think about it, but it's it is as valid or more valid than let's block our program until the pointer gets valid. Yes, in in, in this way, yes. But if we treat get as a synchronization point, then it, it's a different, different I do semantic. Agree. I do agree, but as I said, I don't want to treat it as a synchronization point. Uh, the last question. But even if you don't use it as a synchronization point, it gives you access to the exception. How would you handle the exception in another way if you only pass the value to the receiving function, to the handler function? Uh, you, you wouldn't in this way. So, for example, when you have a Q future and you do a transform something, if it's a value, it will get transformed. If it's an error, it will produce a Q future that returns an error. So that's one of the things, uh, again, didn't want to mention monads, but the idea is you have a box. If you have a value, do whatever you want with it, if you don't have a value, the new box will inherit all the backlog from this, from this box. So whether it's an error, whether it's an, uh, a, a log, how, how that value was produced, or anything else. So you would handle the errors in that way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this talk. Thanks, thanks to Ivan. Uh, uh, we will You're not have. You don't want to try uh, my surname, right? What? You don't want to try to, to pronounce my surname? No, no, no. I try <laughs> to avoid it. <laughs> we have 15 minutes uh, pause, and afterwards is going to be the talk from Lars in this room. So, come back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.